This video lecture will cover ethos. When we were discussing persuasion, we talked about the different types of supporting messages you could use. And uh, just to give a brief review, inartistic proofs that you can use to try to convince, persuade, change your audience, coercion, brainwashing, torture, none of which we are going to use in your speeches, hopefully. And what we are focusing on are artistic proofs, ways that you can artfully change your audience. Logos, which is in a different video lecture, pathos, and ethos. Those last two we will deal with and discuss how you can incorporate these into your speeches. First of all, we'll talk about ethos. There's a quote from Aristotle, there is no proof so effective as that of character. He wrote that many years ago, and it's still something that we are strongly aware of today, because if we do not trust the person who is speaking, or we do not trust the information that they're presenting, then there is little chance that this is going to be persuasive to create any kind of change for the audience. And if our goal is to change, then we have to really take this into consideration. Another quote from a Quintilian, who is a Roman and came from um, uh, medieval times. Rhetoric is a good man speaking well. And let's look at a couple of things here. Of course, uh, this was back in the day when they said a good man speaking well. They actually did mean man, male. Today, we're going to say a good person speaking well uh, because I think if Quintilian lived today, he would agree that this would be the person who would be out there uh, giving a speech, which could be male as well as female. But in his day, it was pretty much the men. All right, but we have a good man. So what does this mean, a good man? Somebody who has good character. This is somebody who is uh, uh, somebody that we believe because they are honest, ethical, they do what they say they're going to do. And so this is an important part of uh, rhetoric or persuasion that we have somebody who is of good character. And then the speaking well is, of course, that we're putting this together artfully in order to make change. Audiences judge credibility at three different times during a speech. And it's important to think about all of these as you're writing your speech and then as you're giving your speech. Uh, first of all, you have your initial credibility. This is the credibility that you have as you're, let, let's say as you're, getting up from your seat, walking to the front of the room, and are about to give your speech, not kind of before you open your mouth, this is your initial credibility. What do I think about you before you have begun this speech? And then we have your derived credibility. This is my assessment of your credibility while you're giving your speech. And then uh, once your speech is done, you've said your last word, you head back to your seat, now, how do I judge your credibility? And terminal could be also long term. So what do I think a month later, five years later, 82 years later? How do I assess your credibility at that point? Now, lest you think this isn't really all that important, I want to give you an example that uh, kind of shows how paying attention to these three different times of credibility is important. When I was in my master's program, uh, we had uh, an author come to our university, somebody whom I knew, and I really enjoyed the books that he wrote. Now, I had to buy a ticket to it. Tickets are expensive. And as a grad student, you don't make a whole lot of money, frankly. You live a pretty meager existence. You know, you buy food and books and not a whole lot else. But this author... I really looked up to and so I wanted to see him so I went ahead and paid the money and this is his initial credibility was so high I was so impressed with him he was one of my kind of my idols of authors thought he was brilliant uh, and I just couldn't wait to hear him so really high initial credibility I go into his presentation and 
there's a number of us sitting there and we're waiting. You know, the time comes for it to start. He's not there. No big deal. He's kind of a genius. Time doesn't really matter. He probably works on on uh, P time, which is polychronic time. So he'll come when it's the right time. Well, then, you know, 15 minutes go by, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. He's not showing up. And we're starting to see some of the people who work there are kind of darting back and forth a little frantically. And so we get the idea that there's something going on here, but we're not quite sure what is happening exactly. And my initial credibility uh, is still high because I don't know what's happening. I don't know if he's had a plane delay. I don't know if he's sick, you know, but... I'm assuming that this will start, and if it doesn't start, then it will be some problem other than the man himself. Lo and behold, he finally comes late, and he kind of shambles onto the stage, kind of stumbles, and he is an even, kind of clutches to the podium for support. He looks at the podium for a couple well, it seemed like a couple of minutes, but it was probably 10, 15 seconds. And then he slowly looks up at the audience. He looks at all parts of the audience. He glares at us, mad, mean. Now, he still has pretty high credibility for me because I'm thinking this is something creative. He's doing something unusual. There's going to be a good reason for this. So I'm still not worried. Then... The first words out of his mouth are, well, don't you have any questions for me? At once, there was silence in the audience. We're not quite sure what to do. We don't know again. Is this some kind of attention-getting device or what? One boy gets up kind of tentatively and asks a question, and the author glares at him snort and says that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard I don't have to stay here for this and he walks off the stage this kind of nervous laughter in the audience and at this point my derived credibility is going down because even if this is a technique I'm not quite sure if he can come back from it at this point I think it's a flop as a technique so his derived credibility is going down, but I still think there's probably going to be something that he's going to try to recoup from this, and I will do my best to be forgiving of him and learn as much as I can, even though he's had this horrible start. So that's what I'm thinking. When suddenly, or actually not so suddenly, we have a worker come out on the stage and say, um, that's it. He's gone back to the hotel. There's not going to be any more tonight. And we all looked at each other and we're just like, what? No way. That's it. And so terminal credibility. He was getting really, he was low at this point. Basically, he had stolen my money. In my opinion, at that point, he had stolen my money, wasted my time, uh, been drunk, which is what happened. He was horribly drunk. And I just could not imagine much worse happening with uh, what, what was my favorite author is now one of my least liked people in the world still today. So that was back in the 80s, and we're way past that. Uh, this is a long time after that, and I still don't like this author because of that experience. And it was this fall from the sky-high amazing credibility all the way down to about the lowest credibility that I can give an author. So we have to think about these things because we can have these huge swings in a short amount of time with credibility. The next thing to talk about is how audiences judge credibility. How do we decide whether somebody is credible or not? And in general, we have the basic benchmarks, integrity, competence, and goodwill. Audiences have to think that you have all of these three things happening in order to judge you as credible. First of all, integrity. Actions much 
must match your words. Uh, seem trustworthy to the audience. Uh, be honest. Avoid mannerisms that are perceived to be deceitful. All right, so I think this is even more important with the generations that are, are just starting college now. People who are born 1997 and later have a much a stronger, probably more rigorous judge for integrity than previous generations. Um, much more rigorous than the millennials or Generation X, baby boomers. Uh, I think this newer generation, which some uh, some are calling the I generation, kind of like iPod, iPhone, I generation, that uh, what's authentic and what's not has a, a very profound impact on whether or not we're going to listen or believe who's there. I think this generation is not interested in pretty words. We're not listen, you're not interested in um, a a face, a facade. You are interested in the reality, uh, authentic, sincere. And when somebody talks one way but behaves another, it not only turns you off of that person, but it really turns um, this generation off on whatever message that person is pretending to promote. And so if somebody's pretending to be, say, a Christian, and they behave in very unchristian sorts of ways, it not only makes an I generation person dislike that uh, that fake person, but it also makes them dislike Christianity to some extent. And so I think this is really potent. It has to really be paid attention to a lot. And we got to be careful because if we're not going to have our actions match our words, then this might be a time we need to shut up rather than spouting off things that we're not actually going to follow through on. So I think this is really important. Now, avoiding mannerisms that are perceived to be deceitful, this is in some ways a nonverbal communication problem as opposed to a um, kind of a character problem. There are certain things that are perceived to be deceitful. Lack of eye contact in the United States is seen as deceitful. And uh, so that's one of the reasons we want to be looking at the audience three quarters of the time that we're only glancing down at notes, 25%. But not only are, is the lack of eye contact perceived to be deceitful, but when the eye contact is too fleeting or darting, that's also perceived to be deceitful. So if you're just glancing at an audience, that's seen as deceitful. So each eye contact needs to have a couple beats to it. You look at your audience one, two, before you then turn to a different part of the audience to look at. So these are important things to understand. Competence. You must know your subject adequately. You have to know everything about it? No. But you have to seem like you have uh, some kind of mastery of what it is that you're talking about. Extemporaneous speaking does a good job at conveying this, that you are able to show that you can take an idea and put it into words at that moment. When you're reading or uh, memorizing, it doesn't seem like it's really yours, and that you might not really know this. You should always cite your sources to show research, avoid plagiarism. Giving sources will make you more credible. Uh, I've had some students who tell me, well, if I give my sources out loud, it will sound like I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm relying on other people. No. Citing these sources lets us know that you have done an amount of research here, which makes us trust you more, and that it's not just coming out of your own head. Now, there are ways that you can cite the sources, which can kind of subtly reinforce that this is a, a good reflection on you. Uh, for instance, instead of saying, I agree with Dr. Jones about blah, 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 you give your position blah, 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 uh, and not only do I think this is a good thing, but Dr. Jones of Harvard University agrees. So sometimes we just turn that little sighting around so that we're showing the source agrees with us rather than we agree with the source. Small thing, but it can help show that you're competent. You must seem confident in your own knowledge. We don't want to do the, hmm, maybe, I think, perhaps, I'm just 
state what you know, and if you don't know something, keep it out of your speech. Avoid the I thinks. I think maybe. For the most part, we just take I think out of there. Anything that you're stating should be your thoughts, so it's automatically what you think. And don't put yourself down. Don't do the apologies. I'm sorry I don't know more about this. I'm sorry I'm not an expert. I'm sorry I've never worked in the industry. Yeah, just leave those out of it. Now, a couple tip tricks about competence, and these are nonverbal tips. Wear glasses if you have them. Glasses will almost immediately make your audience judge that your IQ is higher than when you're not wearing glasses. It's a silly, funny thing, but why not take advantage of it? Dress appropriately for your topic. If you're talking about rock climbing, hey, be dressed in rock climbing gear. Be wearing the right kind of shoes, clothes, harnesses. Great. But if you're talking about interviewing your resumes, I'm going to want to see you in full-on business attire. In general, uh, I recommend that you use a full name when you give a speech. Avoid nicknames uh, because names can have some kind of impact on how people are judging your initial credibility. So uh, for me, if I'm going to give a speech, I will often be introduced as uh, Dr. Margaret Moe. Margaret is my legal first name. I've never gone by it colloquially. People have always called me by a nickname, but the nickname I use is not really all that useful for establishing credibility. Megan. Megan is a name that, I don't know, I hear lots of five-year-olds running around with the name Megan, and so there's something about it that seems a little younger or juvenile. And so if I'm giving a professional speech, I'm often Dr. Margaret Moe. Now, if I don't want to to give off this academic air, if my competence is being more relatable, then I'm not going to use Dr. Margaret Moe because that's kind of intimidating. So I'm going to change it to something else. If I want to be relatable, I might be just Megan Moe. And uh, I also, uh, sometimes depending on the situation, sometimes I'm introduced as Doc Moe. And it's kind of funny, in the advertising world, uh, I didn't ask for this, but in general, in the advertising world, I'm usually called Doc Mo, uh, even by my peers, which is kind of odd uh, that they'll refer to me as Doc Mo as opposed to Megan. And there's something about this. They like to know that I have the academic credential, but they also like me to be friendly and uh, personal. So I guess that's where that comes from. And that establishes the credibility in a way that works well. Goodwill. You need to appear to have the audience's best interest at heart, that you want what's good for the audience, that you are not giving this persuasive speech for your own benefit. Uh, so we're avoiding appearances of self-interest. The golden rule, love your neighbor, your audience as yourself. This usually means that sales messages in a public speech are going to be inappropriate. So you will not take the time for your public speech to try to convince people to buy your brand of windows uh, or to, to hire you as their lawn care specialist. Uh, we need to avoid those 